disturbing account of savagery behind bars at the penitentiary, New Mexico. On the high plains of the desert, 14 miles southwest of the city of Santa Fe, stands a near deserted prison. This is the penitentiary New Mexico, which in the course of a February weekend in 1980 was the scene of the most brutal riot in American prison history. All the forces of hell were unleashed and it happened right there. Never seen that much rage, uh, overt, touchable rage and hate. I never realized that uh, people could be so inhumane. It was overkill. Uh, I heard people being tortured to death, just feet from me, screaming and crying and pleading for their life. All it was about was respect. If you respected me, I respected you. I don't care what color clothes you were wearing. If you fucked with me, then you better come right. On the blue side of the evening, when the darkness takes control, you start looking for a reason to take your lonesome on down the road. The story of what happened here provides a glimpse of the extreme depths of cruelty into which a prison can descend. The savagery was unique, but the events that led up to it could occur in any prison. Built in 1956, the penitentiary had for 20 years been a relatively safe place. But by the mid-1970s, all that was changing. The reason lay in a peculiarity of the prison's design. To save money, the majority of prisoners were housed in dormitories. In 1976, when the state of New Mexico passed tougher sentencing laws, more and more criminals were sent to the penitentiary. The dormitories, with a design capacity of 50, began to overflow. Well, there was 110 of us in this dormitory here. The noise was deafening because you had 20 or 30 radios going all at once, all on different stations, and you had to just sit in here. Those day rooms to the back were dangerous places at night, especially if the CO was down drinking coffee at the guard's kitchen. You were left to fend for yourself. When I first came in here, there was people sleeping on the floors. All the bunks were taken. Uh, Sleeping in the aisles, you'd walk here to go to the uh, commode and you stepped on somebody, fights would break out. It just got to be insane. I mean, they were, they were just jam-packing people into them. And at one point, I know there was close to 100 in the dormitories. I mean, it, it had went from single bunks to bunk beds and then to people sleeping on the floors. I mean, it, it, they were, it was like sardines. I remember my first day. Came to work and and uh, was issued my uniform and 
there was really no essential training. As they just escorted throughout the prison and shown the different dormitories, was fingerprinted and so forth. And that was the extent of it. And I was just a, a nervous wreck. Just to be, to see so many prisoners and that I was gonna be having to watch them all. Who ever ever thought that a penitentiary could be run with dormitories was out of their minds, especially in the 70s, 80s. You know, that was not going to happen. I mean, not without problems. And um, eventually it was the undoing, because that many people were in one place at one time, and it, it caught up with them. By early 1978, a combination of overcrowding and undermanning was making the dormitories virtual no-go areas. I remember one time we had a drinking spree. We had made a lot of hooch. What it was was um, homemade beer. We drank about 15 gallons. People were falling all over the aisles here, dead drunk. They had uh, some poor guy back here dancing on the table. And then after a while, they took him down because always that day room was dark and they took him down. And I think I was bunking right here at the time. And you could smell the feces, the human feces, and I knew right away what was happening. And the guy comes out and says, hey, you want to get some of this? And I said, no, I don't want to get some of that. So that's what the damn fools, don't you know that that's what the administration wants you to do? You know, I don't want any part of that. The original idea of, of, the, of the penitentiary, and, and the word penitentiary comes from, comes from the word penance, uh, just like monks doing penance in a monastery, uh, was really to set up prisons as monasteries so that inmates would sit silently in their cells, meditate, read the Bible, and, and have a transformation. When prisons became overcrowded, then it meant we had to allow inmates to congregate with each other, had to allow inmates to work inside the prison, uh, have association with each other. And when that happened, it, it meant that the idea of rehabilitation becomes secondary. What, what becomes important now is how do you control these people because they outnumber us, they can take over our prison, they can burn it down, they can kill us. So how do you control them? How do you keep them from tearing up your prison? On the blue side of me. The penitentiary of New Mexico's answer to the problem of control was simple. The increasingly overcrowded dormitories were situated together at the south end of the penitentiary. At the opposite, north end, were cell blocks where those considered dangerous or disruptive could be isolated. The most dangerous inmates were segregated in cell block three. By 1978, uh, there were as many as 25% of the inmate population in cell block three, which meant that it was we were well over 200 inmates in the disciplinary unit, which was designed to only hold 86 inmates. Overcrowding was not the only hardship for those confined in cell block three. The officers assigned there often supplemented segregation with a cruder form of control. Many times uh, when you're brought down here handcuffed behind your back, uh, the guards would sort of like help you along down the stairs. You'd fall at the bottom of the stairs. I remember a guard going down and said, uh, you must have slipped, let me help you up. And he started kicking on me. There's hundreds of guys that have experienced that. It was a time when you came through the fucking door, you knew the next thing was a boot in the ass and you were going down the fucking stairs. That was just part of the fucking getting locked up. We never hardly ever used any physical force on an inmate unless he refused to to do as he was told such as when you wanted to lock him up and in, in, in this in a disciplinary cell and they would not you would use uh, 
as much force as needed. You know, you, we, we don't carry, or we didn't carry guns in, in the uh, penitentiary. But uh, discipline uh, uh, could go to as high as grabbing the guy by the button and throw him into a cell. There was one incident in particular, uh, cell block three, when they had brought in a person to segregation and they started beating him. And that's um, <clears throat> when they make, would make comments to me to, to join in, and I told them I couldn't. Because there was just, uh, the numbers were too great on one individual. The most extreme punishment the prison could officially administer was meted out in the basement of cell block three. These two cells on the end are what's known as the uh, <clears throat> sensory deprivation cells. Of course, these were always closed at all times, so there was no light going in, no ventilation, no sound. When you were in inside these cells, uh, you felt that you had been swallowed by something. We always referred to these as being in the belly of the beast. There was no light, there was no, no toilet, there was no bed, there was nothing in there, just a hole in the, in, in, in the, in the floor so he could use the bathroom. And he would get a, a sandwich, one sandwich a day, or a sandwich for each meal, and some water. And 10, 15 days of that, and well, that guy came out being a good boy, a good discipline, discipline, real good. Takes me back to a lot of bad memories. I can hear a scratching on the walls, and that scratching. <coughs> That scratching was my scratching. <laughs> Segregation and brutality were not the answer to the problem of control. For one thing, there were simply too many inmates to lock up. For another, straightforward coercion just fueled prisoners' resentments and strengthened their solidarity. There were eight, ten of us white dudes that, that would ride together under any circumstances. It didn't matter how many, where, when, to what extreme we would do it. I mean, it was just survival. You know, I mean, everybody there is a fucking thieving, lying, dope fiend. You know what I mean? You, 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 you know, when you're out on the streets chasing the dragon, you can, you know, you don't have to associate with those people 24-7, but in there you do. And there's a lot of competition because there's very little to compete for. I've seen people hurt and or killed over a pack of cigarettes. And, you know, out here, if you don't pay your bills, they take your fucking house. In there, you don't pay your bills, they'll take your fucking life. It was the law of the jungle. It was the, it was the law of the strongest. And so how do you become strong? You fit together in a group. And that you walk together in a group and you do things together in a group. And so if you try to, if you, if, if you try to do your time, one day at a time, and you don't participate in that, and you don't belong to anybody, then they're going to get you, and they're going to get you, and they're going to hurt you, and they're going to use you, and they're going to enjoy it. By the end of 1978, the population had reached an all-time high of 1,272 inmates. Increasingly outnumbered, prison guards needed a form of control that would reduce inmate solidarity rather than reinforcing it. The answer was the snitch jacket. To have a snitch jacket hung on you 
would, uh, would mean that uh, you would be labeled as a snitch. It was a threat. It was a way to threaten information out of an inmate by saying, if you don't tell us what we want to know, we're just going to pass it around to the other inmates in here that you're a snitch. And as you know, I mean, uh, being a snitch in a prison um, means that, that your life expectancy probably isn't going to be too long. Snitches were informants. Real or suspected, they needed protection. They too had to be placed in a cell block. In their case, it was cell block four, where they were housed alongside other vulnerable prisoners such as rapists and pedophiles. By using inmates as snitches, officers extracted information with which they could anticipate trouble. By labeling inmates as snitches, they created a climate of suspicion and fear in the general prison population. It was divide and rule. What the snitch system did was to deflect the hatred and resentment inmates felt for the authorities towards the inmates held here in cell block four. But turning inmate on inmate was a high-risk strategy of control. The penitentiary had become a tinderbox, only needing a spark to ignite, which the adjacent cell block, five, would provide. Some very hardcore, dangerous inmates were in cell block five. Then they decided they had to do some renovation work in cell block five, some major construction uh, repair work in cell block five, and so all those inmates in cell block five had to be moved someplace else. I don't know who made the decisions and how they made them, but I know that many of the inmates from cell block five were moved as a block into dormitory E2. Very dangerous inmates all put into a dormitory where it's all one big open area and crowded with inmates. About 25% of them hardcore, the other 75% weaklings that were subservient to the hardcore. And these hardcore pretty much left alone to run that unit. A week after the move of that hardcore to E2, newcomer Gary Nelson arrived at the penitentiary. They assign you to a unit as soon as you get fingerprinted and everything, and I remember, as clear as could be even this day, the guard walking over there and picking up the phone and saying, I've got Nelson, where do you want to put him? And he said, uh, and then I heard the guard say, are you sure? He said, okay, if you say so. And he turned around, looked at me and said, could you live at E2? And not being from New Mexico, I really couldn't tell you very much about their prison system at all. He, I just looked at him and said, E2, B2, what difference would it make? On the night of Friday, February the 1st, 1980, there were 12 officers supervising 1,157 inmates, or so it was estimated. The exact population was not known. It was really tricky doing your counts at night. You're thinking to yourself, I hope they're asleep. You don't want to turn the lights on because you don't want them to wake up. You're going with a flashlight hoping the batteries are going to be strong enough to illuminate your way so that you won't step on someone's face as you're tiptoeing in among them trying to count bodies. Uh, it gets very hairy. And uh, because it was frightening to do that, I know some officers did not even do the counts at night. They'd call in a number that was called in the time before. And hopefully no one's gotten out since then. The newly arrived hardcore at E2 had been drinking illicit beer since the early evening. It was a typical night in the penitentiary, New Mexico. There was nothing pre-planned about this. Uh, people talk about, yeah, they're going to be a riot, they're going to be this. Just nothing at all. And we're all sitting around playing cards, doing things. All of a sudden, uh, Somebody got up, jumped up and said, uh, Danny Ray Macias. I mean, it's well documented at this point. I said that, uh, hey, tired of this place. When they come to count, if they don't like that door, we're going to jump them and take over this place. And anybody that stays in bed is going to get hurt. At 1.09 a.m. on Saturday, February the 2nd, prison officers moved to Ord the prison's south end to do a final check of the dormitories a process which many of them detested and feared. In order to speed their work up, the most basic security procedures, such as locking the doors of the dormitories behind them, were, as usual, ignored. 
I remember laying there on my bed thinking, boy, I sure hope he locks that door. That'll stop this. And they didn't like that door. So they had uh, two guards, one on the opposite side from me was counting, and one on my side was a lieutenant. I believe his name was Anaya. And Lieutenant Anaya was walking up, and as he got near my bed, Someone ran and jumped him. They grabbed the other guard. At the same time, someone had run and uh, kicked open the door all the way and grabbed the guard at the front door and had all three of them at that point. Uh, took the keys, uh, took their clothes off. People started putting bandanas over their face and everything, and I mean, it was payback time. On the blue side of the evening when the darkness takes control You start looking for a reason To take your lonesome on down the road and This is where I was having breakfast Oh, about 1.30 in the morning with uh, Tonya V. Hill That's when we heard I was going to leave, and he says, have a cup of coffee with me. I said, oh, okay, I guess I could take another five minutes. That's where we heard a really strange, loud grumbling noise. The strangest thing you could hear at 1.30. It was 1.45 in the morning. That's when we came out to the hall, and we saw literally hundreds of inmates just pouring out of the dormitories. And I said, my God, what is going on? I thought maybe a fight had broken out into the hallways. And I said, no, it's just not reasonable a fight that big could break loose. I was going to rush down and try and close those grills over there, but it seemed like as though somebody was guarding those grills dressed in an officer's uniform. And I didn't recognize the individuals. Uh, and then I saw, that's when I saw that they were kicking an individual, I believe it came out to be Juan Bustos, an officer, literally rolling him down the hallway uh, with kicks. And, and, and it was, I would say, anywhere between 100 and 200 individuals. And um, they were just filling out, and it was just mass chaos. And that's when we exited up towards the control center and um, I banged on the windows to the control center and I head out back up to the north side of the facility instead of going out the front door. The rioting inmates were also making for the control center because it contained the keys for every lock in the penitentiary. Security in the control center was so important that it was always manned by two guards and protected by a sheet of specially reinforced glass installed just two weeks previously. Uh, they got in front of the control center and demanded uh, that they, you know, open it up. They, were, of course, they refused. They weren't going to open it up. Uh, I mean, they've been trained that way not to open it up. They were kicking the hostage. I don't know what the hostage's name was, but they were kicking him, you know, threatening him and threatening to cut his throat. Eventually, uh, took a fire extinguisher, broke the window. I mean, at first, they threw the window. Uh, I mean, you got this supposedly bulletproof glass. It may very well have been bulletproof, but uh, it wasn't fire extinguisher proof. He got it, and he threw it with such force and might at the control center window that it sort of like penetrated and stuck in the window. And that's when they said, well, that, they threw it again, and that's when they actually created a little hole, and that's when they started sticking pipes in the window and creating a larger hole and larger hole, and that's how they got in the control center. Once they were in the control center, they essentially had the institution. And all the keys? And all the keys that that would mean to the entire institution. My feelings then were, were that it was over with, because we had, um, we had some really very dangerous uh, inmates in this, in, the, in, in this institution. When I was released from my cell, the, the first place I went was the pharmacy, and, and then went and proceeded to consume it, everything I had gotten from the pharmacy. But... What did you get? What did you take then? Drugs. Just whatever they had. I mean, a lot of, a lot of liquid Valium and a lot of Demerol and... Um, I don't know, numerous other drugs. I mean, there was quite a bit. And, um, and lots of other people there doing the same thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, anybody that could get, get up was getting down, yeah. The guards who had fled the control center 
alerted the state police, who began to congregate outside the prison at 2.15 a.m. But they didn't storm the prison, for fear that the inmates would kill the 12 officers that they had taken hostage. Three of those hostages were being held in cell block three. Raymond Gutierrez, Edward Ortega, and Larry Mendoza. Oh, we were right here in this holding area for mattresses, the three of us. This is as far back as we could come. The bottom of Sabla 3 and as far back as we can. This is where we were stripped naked and gave up all of our belongings. I somehow hung on to my ring. But um, this is where we were being threatened with being raped and so forth for the first day. By 4 a.m., negotiations had begun outside the prison, with a handful of inmate leaders putting their demands to the assembled news media. The first list of demands, and this wasn't made public, but it should have been, was for a pool table in every dorm, and stakes. This is what they thought about. This is, so when you sit there and you listen to people write that bullshit, excuse me, write that garbage about, they were, they were writing demands for they wanted better living conditions and all of that. No, they weren't. They were there to harm people. I remember the first guy that uh, died was a guy who normally cleaned up the hall. It was a snitch informant. Had somebody uh, took a pipe, hit him in the head, a piece of his skull flew up against the wall. Um, body started quivering as he lay on the ground. Uh, I mean, it was like the first death, and you just start realizing, you know, this is a lot of potential to be violent, just a lot of potential. And things just started escalating from there. You could smell a lot of fear. There was a lot of people there that did not want to be there without guards there to um, keep the order and the peace. They, they really didn't like the fact that, that convicts were running, you know, I mean, we that had control of the penitentiary. And, uh, we've taken care of business, how are things over there? At one point, we were walking down the hallway and somebody came and said that there was a, and this phrase has been blown out of proportion, there was an execution squad running around killing people. On the blue side of the evening, when the darkness takes control, you start there was an execution squad in the prison that night, and it had a single destination. You got all those people down there in cell block four, and it's not each and every one of them, it's just some of them have told on people that are there in prison, many of, of whom had life sentences, many of whom know they'll never see freedom again because somebody down there in cell block four has told on them. You can imagine what happens at the point to where you have people who are in prison for life. They now have the keys to the place where the individual who has put them in prison for life is. The self-appointed execution squad did have the keys to enter cell block four, but they could not operate the control panel by which the individual cells were opened cowering against the back wall of those cells, just nine feet from their would-be killers, the inmates of cell block four believed their bars would keep them safe. They were wrong. Acetylene torches, left overnight by contractors working on the repairs, had been discovered in cell block five. Now every cell could be opened, and every score could be settled. The execution squad could go to work. There was an execution squad in the prison that night, and I understand you were part of it, is that right? Yeah. Leroy Vigil, recently diagnosed with incurable hepatitis B, has decided to speak for the first time of the role he played in cell block four. I, I went in there to find two guys there that I wanted to kill, you know. And uh, one of them was Jimmy Villa, 
to be Joe Villa, and the other one was uh, Mike Briones, but Mike Briones was the dead already when I got there. And uh, to be to be truthful, I I would have uh, enjoyed every, every bit of it killing them, you know, because uh, they tested there. Uh, Mike Briones made statements against me. And Jimmy Joe Vela, he, he uh, testified against me in my trial yeah, when we took us downtown for trial. For they, 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 he testified on something that I never done. And uh, they gave me 300 years for that. But I would have enjoyed every bit of it killing him. I would have enjoyed every bit of it. So I killed some people, and I wouldn't say no names, but I did. I did kill some people. The district attorney's office later photographed the victims in cell block four as evidence. The photographs revealed that to kill the detested snitch was never sufficient. The maximum fear, suffering and mutilation had to be inflicted first. One inmate was killed when a piece of melted cell bar was driven through his head. The masked inmates worked their way from cell to cell, selecting those who were to die, taunting them with what would happen when their cell door was burned open. In all, 16 inmates died in cell block four. The last had to wait three hours for their moment to come. There's, there's some guys there that, uh, uh, like I said, you know, some of them deserve to die, and, you know, some maybe not, maybe some didn't deserve to die. But, uh, you know, uh, when I went, when I was, when I was going around looking for who I wanted to get, you know, who I was, who was getting my wage, they, they, they just had to die, you know. By now, the state police positioned beyond the perimeter fence at the prison's north end were starting to glimpse the full horror of what was occurring in cell block four. Early Saturday morning, myself and another can officer, uh, Buddy Size, we're watching with binoculars and just watching the activities because they're just raising cane inside. And we watched a guy be, being held up by two individuals. And he was standing uh, basically looking like he was looking out the window, but he's not looking out. And they had a torch, and they just started cutting on his face with a torch. And they started working on his eyeballs uh, with a torch. And all of a sudden, his, his head exploded. Well, I guess the gas is building up with the heat of the ceiling. And I looked over at Buddy, and I said, did you, did you see that? And he says, yeah. And I just couldn't, I, I couldn't believe I just watched somebody die, and there's not a damn thing we could do about it. Yeah, there was a certain amount of frustration taken out in cell block four, yeah, against people that had put other people in the penitentiary. Yeah, there was a certain amount of... But to tell you the truth, that, that was over with before noon Saturday. It was... that was... whatever happened in there happened immediately and was done. And you've been accused of involvement in that. Were you involved? Were you in cell block four? I'd been in cell block four before, yeah. Michael Colby was charged with two counts of murder after the riot, but convicted of neither on grounds of insufficient evidence. No witnesses could be found who would testify against him. It was a free shot opportunity to hurt. Nobody could stop him. They knew we weren't coming in. They were already told that we weren't coming in. And as long as the guard wasn't thrown out dead, we weren't coming in. At 7 a.m., just before dawn on Saturday, February the 2nd, a group of inmates dragged out an officer who had been injured when taken hostage. Elton Curry had been stabbed, beaten, and kicked. Inmate leaders had decided he needed urgent medical attention. Take him back. He's going to take him back. 
I think everybody realized that the minute a an officer died, we died. You know, that was a preservation thing. I mean, that was the only ace we had. The only reason they weren't in there is because we had the officers. So. But no one was going to come in to save the men in cell block four. Who gives a fuck about them? I mean, the way they were treating them, they were in a six by nine, two or three of them living in there like that. They didn't care about them. Once they got the usefulness of them testifying or, or giving up the information they gave up, they're as useless to them as they are to us. Matter of fact, they're a burden to them because they have to take care of them. So no, they don't give a fuck about that at all. Throughout the Saturday, the standoff continued, but a fire started in the gymnasium was threatening to engulf the penitentiary. By 5 p.m., it had reached the basement of cell block three where Larry Mendoza and his two colleagues were still being held hostage. My whole cell block was literally, it was, it looked on fire, the walls were all black, everybody, there was masked individuals walking around, people that looked like they were all on drugs. And uh, I looked down the hallway, literally down south, and, and, and it was just, it was just a, 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 a strange mist in the air. This is where uh, I didn't realize of where, oh, how serious of a situation this was because the, the, that's when the penitentiary was already be, be flooded. There was a foot of water that we were walking through. And that's when we were transferred, I would say Saturday after, Saturday evening up here into this day room of cell block six. Right in here is where we spent our last day before we were released inside of cell block six in here. And this is where the real terror really came in. That's when individuals walked in here and said to us, you want to see how, what is, how serious the situation this has come down? This individual came up in front of us and was literally holding a human head. And um, it is quite traumatizing to speak about this still. But he put this head right in front of each one of us, and they told us to choose which one of us would be next. This decapitation. I didn't realize what it was, and I said, my God, to Edwards, could that be something from the kitchen? He says, no. He just about went into shock. It was a human head. It was a black man, a black man's head. Later on, I come to learn now it was Paulina Paul. Paulina Paul was a cell block four inmate with a mental age of 12. He had been decapitated with a shovel. Sunday, February the 3rd, the second full day of the riot, dawned with most of the inmates lining the perimeter fence to escape the violence inside the prison. A hard call continued to conduct negotiations. Among them suspected leaders of the white supremacist prison gang the Aryan Brotherhood, Jack Stevens, and Michael Colby. Look here. No, 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 no segregation. No, no, no. I'm going to tell you right now, you can't put people in cell block three because there's no cell block three there. I was ecstatic. It was cool to have the, you know, to be able to do, go wherever you wanted to do. You know, I mean, it was, it was like a party. I mean, I'd been there at that point for six years, and the foot had been on the neck. And it was a relief to be away from that, just like a party at the end of the week, on the weekend, is a relief from work. Well, that was a relief, only it's exaggerated quite a bit by the circumstances. I mean, um, to get back at the shit they had been doing to us and everybody there. In one form or another, every motherfucker there got fucking abused somehow. We were escorted out here onto the grass and this is where negotiations had finally come down, but there was a breakdown was coming down in the negotiations. There was hundreds of state police and National Guard and every law enforcement agency that you could even imagine. Jack Stevens, Michael Colby, and other individuals that were the Aryan Brotherhood actually wanted to have uh, Ray and I killed publicly. 
to show the extent of the, what, what had occurred inside the, the prison. But that's when we were brought right on out to the front, and I was whisked, whisked right on out the front, front gates over here. I didn't realize how bad a shape I was until, until that first night at home. I woke up um, in shirt shock and terror all night long, screaming, 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 uh, just pure nightmare. I thought I was still at the prison. Let's go, let's go. Just after 1.30 p.m., a SWAT team was ordered in, and after 36 hours, the riot was at an end. The last hostages had been released when inmate leaders such as Michael Colby were granted the request for transfer to prisons in other states. And as soon as we entered the main lobby, going up the steps into the main lobby, we could see the total destruction that had occurred. There was water on the floor about a foot deep and filthy water with all kinds of crap floating in the water. Pills and capsules and syringes and debris stunk to the high heaven. It stunk of smoke and it stunk of, uh, it also stunk of death. I found that even though I, I knew the inmates so well, I was having grave difficulty identifying them. With their face that close to mine, I couldn't tell you who they were or had been because they had been so horribly brutalized and mutilated. And, uh, a lot of my, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't say. I couldn't say who they were. One inmate in cell block four, a case he had dealt with personally, had special significance for Larry Flood. That was Mario Yuriosti. He's from Santa Fe, was from Santa Fe, New Mexico. A youngster, really. He was in for shoplifting. <clears throat> the week before the riot, he had been gang raped by seven inmates. And he wanted to press charges. So I needed to get him where it was as safe as possible. Well, there's not really a safe place in the prison, but I had him transferred in voluntary protective custody in cell block four, north end, main facility, penitentiary, New Mexico. His was one of the bodies I did recognize when I got to cell block four. He was hanging from the grill work separating the officer's station from the north corridor uh, by a, a rope or a piece of sheet knotted together or something. His throat had been cut. His genitals had been cut off. And they were stuffed in his mouth. It wasn't a safe place. Not for Mario. He should never have even been in the penitentiary. Let alone there and then. You say you feel no guilt for what you did? No. No guilt at all. We've seen some of the photographs that uh, the district attorney's office took of the victims. And they are savage. I mean, they almost look as if they might be the work of, of an animal. That's what we that's what the administration made us. She chose to do it. It was your choice to do what you did. Yeah. Because that's, that, like I said, uh, <clears throat> the administration made us that way. If they want to treat us like dogs like they used to, you know, it would have it been different. But the administration treated us like dogs. I mean, they, they didn't treat us like no human. They're animals. You, if, if you've ever seen lions devour meat, that's what I thought. That's what it was like. It was, it was the, the blood was, was splattered all over. And, and, and then you look around and then you just say, how could people do this to somebody else? How could you do that? We saw the cell where they burned their way through before they, they burned the guy with the blowtorch and before they put the rod through his head and all that. And you just think, you just, you just imagine what, what it was like. It was like all the forces of hell were unleashed. 
and it happened right there. In all, 34 inmates died during the course of the New Mexico prison riot. of the riot, New Mexico's Attorney General was commissioned to produce a report, an attempt to uncover the reasons for the unique savagery. The report, which ran to over 200 pages, identified as the chief cause forms of control within the prison that made already brutal men more brutal and dehumanized both keepers and kept. When I worked on the Attorney General's report, uh, interviewing people, uh, talking with people, and looking at the pictures of the results of the violence, it's something I had nightmares about for years, personally. Um, and it's something that I'll never forget. Uh, it's a watershed incident. But it, it's not just a personal incident. It's also an incident that tells us a lot about prisons, because it allows us to view what happens in a prison if we lose sight of how we can humanely control inmates. It probably would never play itself out exactly as it played itself out in New Mexico, but the dynamite is still there. It's just waiting for a match to go off. At New Mexico, it went off. Today, only a handful of staff remains at the prison. Everything but the prison infirmary finally closed in November 1998. The penitentiary in New Mexico simply could not recover from the riot. I think the majority of the people that were involved got away with what occurred out there. I don't think the state knows really who did what to this day. Those 36 hours in the riot, I aged literally, I felt like 20 years. Could live a lifetime and never forget it. On the blue side of the evening, when the darkness takes control, you start looking for a reason to take your lonesome on down the road. George Carmen QC. Mr. Hammond. 